This is Dan Schneider, and on this edition of the Dan Schneider Video Interview, I will be talking about the writer Elmer Kelton. Uh, we'll be talking about his life and his literary career with his son and two experts on his life and career, and that'll be in just a moment. And we're ready to talk about uh, the life, times, and writings of Elmer Kelton. And I have three guests on uh, the show. Going from left to right, they are Joyce Roach and Judy Alter, who are experts on the writings of Elmer Kelton. And on the far right, I have Steve Kelton, Elmer Kelton's son. Uh, so let me start off with Steve, and let's talk a little bit about who your father was. I know I had read his uh, memoir first, Sandhills Boy, and I know uh, he uh, uh, had served in World War II, and uh, he had uh, married, I guess, your mother, who was a, a German war bride, and uh, she had her own son. So why don't you tell a little bit about the background of your father uh, before we get into his writing, who he was and where he came from. Fine. Dad, uh, Dad grew up in uh, on a ranch outside of Crane, Texas, which is uh, pretty far to the west. And uh, that's the life he knew. He, he knew cowboys. He and some old timers who were almost old enough to have gone up the trails. Uh, he did go to World War II. Uh, he was young, so he was late into the war. Uh, his specialty uh, became obsolete before he went overseas, so he was retrained, and that, and as a result, he missed the Battle of the Bulge, which I guess was fortunate for all of us. And uh, he met my mother in Austria. And when he shipped back to the, the States after his hitch was up, uh, he arranged to bring her over. It took a couple of years, but he got it done. And uh, they settled in San Angelo, where Dad had a job with the San Angelo Standard Times as an agricultural reporter. And he maintained uh, his journalism career uh, until his retirement in, 19, in 1990. Uh, he was with the Standard Times, and then he was with Ranch Magazine, and Sheep and Goat Raisers Association, and then he joined Livestock Weekly in 1968, uh, as again retiring in 1990, and at that point began to devote full time to his books. But he wrote at night uh, and on weekends and put out 40-some-odd uh, novels, I believe. I lose track, and I forgot to check that. Now, number, but uh, uh, while he was working, I I remember the typewriter going in all hours of the night. Now, I, I first found out about your father a few years back when my wife and I had gone to San Angelo uh, on a vacation, and uh, uh, there was a, a local bookstore that had a whole Elmer Kelton section, and I think there's even a building with a mural of your father painted on the side, but he's sort of a local legend in San Angelo. Uh, the the San Angelo newspaper that he worked for, um, uh, was he a, a reporter? I, I think I read uh, that he did general reporting outside of the Livestock Weekly. Didn't he, didn't he also uh, do like investigative reporting on uh, and things? Well, there was a little bit of that. Uh, he's, his specialty was agriculture and he, had, he ran the agriculture column after a certain period of time. Uh, he did a little investigative reporting during the Billy Solesta scandals because it was related to agriculture. And he was one of two reporters who actually were escorted up to a hotel room where Billy Saul was. Nobody else in the country knew where he was. But uh, that's probably as close to investigative reporting, I guess, as, as he would have done. He did the uh, guest worker uh, program uh, during the 50s, the Rosero program, went into Mexico and, and you know, uh, described a lot of how that worked and how they were recruited and, and pretty much that, that sort of thing. Most of the time it was simply visiting with farmers and ranchers and, and getting their perspective on things. Uh, he reported throughout the 1950s drought, which was essentially seven years, depending on where he happened to be standing. And that was what gave him the uh, the, ba 
the baseline to write the time it never rained, which by most people's standards is probably the best known of his books. Now I know when I read the the memoir, your father had started out writing uh, for a, a magazine, like you know the the penny a penny a word kind of thing. Um, did uh, was that in the late forties after the war? That would have been, yes, uh, right after the war. In fact, he was he had returned to the University of Texas to finish his journalism degree, and I think he sold his first short story during that period of time or shortly after. And uh, when the pulps gradually dwindled, uh, his agent got him a book-length project, a novel-length project uh, with the Valentine books, and he was scared to death trying to do that. What he did was expand the short story and flesh it out, and that turned out to be the beginning of, of the whole novel career. Yeah, uh, was he, now did he write, now I, I know when I read the, uh, the Time It Never Rained, for people to call that a Wesson just because it's set in Texas is kind of misleading. I think he, it has more in common with the, the novels of a John Steinbeck than uh, than Zane Grey. But uh, I did read that he originally started out writing classic, you know, uh, uh, Owen Wister, Zane Grey type Western novels, correct? That is correct. Uh, he, he was always trying to reach something a little different. Uh, Dad has said in, in a number of times that plotting was not his long suit, that he he appreciated characters more. Mm -hmm. So he built the stories around the characters and, and the plots sort of developed themselves. Yeah. But that's what he was trying to do and his uh, publisher said, well, send me the same thing, but just make it different. <laughs> and that's, that was the, the direction he got. But uh, Greg, you know, he began to to branch out from the, uh, the pretty much the action genre and yeah. try to develop characters and let them let those characters and their their traits and situations create the storyline. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's uh, turn to Judy uh, Alter then. Uh, Judy, uh, since uh, Steve has sort of set the tone with uh, uh, talking about Elmer Kelton, the man. Uh, why don't you uh, just introduce yourself and uh, your relation to Kelton, uh, whether you worked with him or, or, or were a critic or whatnot, and then talk a little bit about uh, Elmer Kelton's writing. Well, I was fortunate enough to be with TCU Press, and the former director made an arrangement to reprint, I think it was the time Never Rained was first. We eventually reprinted something like close to 20 of, of Elmer's novels, uh, and they were bestsellers for us. The second highest bestseller on our list ever was The Time It Never Rained. So I enjoyed working with Elmer. I enjoyed getting to know him. I remember all his stories about the transition from genre westerns to the distinctive work that he did. I think, Steve can correct me, the first breakout novel was The Day the Cowboys Quit. Gotcha. Uh, mm -hmm. And he struggled over the time it never rained. Rewrote it several times. Um, couldn't get it like he wanted it. But he finally did and it was, it was great. Um, he was a wonderful storyteller. He told great stories about like when, when he announced to his father he wanted to be a journalist. His father said, it's a trouble with you kids. Nobody wants to work today. Um, so it was a wonderful friendship, working relationship, and I tried to reprint every novel that I could get permission for. Um, his New York publishers held the original contract, yeah. but some of them went out of print, and we kept them in print. Well, when you say that uh, they were bestsellers for you, uh, what did they sell in their original printing in New York? I mean, was he a best-selling Western writer? Uh, that I mean, could he l live off of his writing and just did the the work as a journalist in his later years on his side, or was it, it one of those things where because it was a genre, it was marginalized and and he didn't make as much as say, uh, uh, I, I don't know, Jacqueline Suzanne, someone from the sixties or seventies like that. I don't think he ever reached that point of sales in New York. Yeah, but he did for us because he had a built-in regional audience who knew him. And he was great about going around and talking to various groups. We used to laugh about, if you've heard Elmer once, you've heard everything he's going to say, but you're still spellbound and you sit there and listen to him. 
Um, would you agree, Steve, that he didn't get really best-selling status in New York? Uh, that's true. Uh, you know, the, most of the publishing companies didn't put a lot of effort into to publishing westerns. They saw them as the genre type thing, regardless what they were. And that was one of the reasons he had to rewrite the time it never rained so many times, because it just wasn't what they wanted. Yeah, I think I read uh, that he had originally written it, uh, the first draft, in like 58 or 59, and it, he it sat around for seven or eight years. He did a second draft, and then he sat around for another four or five years and did a third and final draft. That's about correct. I, I can't tell you just exactly, I forget now just when it came out originally. But it was 72 or 73. Yeah. yeah. The thing we did that I liked was our covers were prettier than the New York covers. We did some beautiful editions of his work. Yeah. I, I would agree. I, the, the original time it never rained, they, they had the characters had on backwards, for heaven's sake. That was the New York deal. Well, we then just, they reprinted it, and uh, the, most of the cover was uh, Saguaro Cactus. Yeah. which does not exist in West Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let me bring in the third member of uh, our group here, uh, Joyce Roach. I only have her by audio. But Joyce, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your knowledge and relationship with Elma Kelton and talk a little bit about your opinions on his writing. Yes, I'd be glad to do that. <clears throat> I've been listening to Steve and, and Judy, and I've got to go back to, uh, to Steve talking about his dad. The one thing he did at uh, workshops and that sort of thing that, and he did often, our symposiums, he was always in demand really for speakers and that sort of thing. And his advice to young writers was, don't give up your day job. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and I think he was right about that, you know, and that he knew, as he said, I, he could never have made a living just at writing. Uh, another thing that was always interesting to me about when he talked, and that was that uh, he would uh, say, uh, which amused everybody, he said, <clears throat> most of Western heroes, you know, are six feet tall and brave, and he said, my, my heroes, he said, are five feet eight and nervous, <laughs> which always was delightful to hear him say, as, as Judy said, you no matter how many times, uh, he would give these programs and say these things in front of large audiences. We never grew tired of listening to, to Elmer. And I, I skipped over because I was so interested in, in listening to Steve and Judy. Uh, I didn't say who I was uh, or what my relationship was. I first met uh, Elmer Kelton uh, because of Western Writers of America uh, through that organization. Then later on, uh, he was always present at Texas Folklore Society where he freely admitted that he was uh, a liar and a thief because he stole, as he said, ideas from, from that organization, from many of those papers that were given at the folklore meeting, which of course I think he felt that all writers, not just himself, but all writers were liars and thieves. Then I uh, uh, became acquainted with him um, over the years, mainly even through TCU Press, being around him there, and Judy and I both were at meetings where he was, and uh, I don't know how we got to be what I'd say personal friends. We knew his, uh, his we know his, his uh, wife Ann. We're around her a lot. She even baked us a, a Linzer toy at Christmas one year. Each of us, and uh, we were in his home uh, a time or two. But uh, Elmer, well, I'm probably jumping ahead of uh, what I need to say. But anyway, I, he wrote the he wrote. Uh, an introduction for a book of mine called The Cowgirls. And then later on, I wrote the afterword for one of his books called Honor at Daybreak, which was his least favorite book, or probably the, the least selling book, because he got out of, uh, he got really uh, out of cattle country and into the oil field business. Uh, and I wrote about that. Uh, and so that's how I'm acquainted with him and uh, have my opinions about him. Yeah. Uh, now, Joyce and, and Judy, uh, you are you both scholars that work uh, at universities? I worked at TCU. Yeah. And Joyce? Well, and, and Judy is a scholar. I'm not a scholar, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm a writer, and I've written a lot about Elmer. 
Well, let me um, let me ask both then Judy and Joyce specifically. Uh, let's talk about uh, Elmer Kelton, his place within Western literature from its beginnings. I guess most people would say, I mean, there were the the penny. Uh, the time novels of the 1800s, but most people think of Western literature classic beginning with Owen Wister's The Virginian in the early 20th century. And so when we talk about serious Western literature, I know in, uh, before I uh, even started reading him that uh, uh, Kelton had won like seven or eight of the top awards in the Western genre. Uh, and uh, so he, he's highly regarded as one of probably the top three or four uh, Western writers of all time. But I, I think, having just read the, what's generally considered his best book uh, by most critics that I've, I've read, uh, uh, The Time It Never Rained, that, that that easily transcends the Western genre. So if both of you can give your opinion on Kelton as a figure in Western literature, his import, and then also how you think he, he goes beyond that in his best works. So uh, Judy or Joyce, either one of you want to go first? Well, go on. I'm sorry. What? Go on. Go on. Joe. Right, no, one of you. I was waiting on. I was waiting on you. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Joyce. I think when Elmer wrote, really, what he called himself powder burners, uh, but they still were in the Owen Wister uh, tradition. Except his powder burners always went further. He mixed cultures, uh, especially. He was especially good at talking about. Uh, the Hispanic blend of what was going on with the regular quote cowboy, but he also was good at uh, the German influence was always there in his novels. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, the time it never, excuse me, I'm sorry, the good old boys, uh, even in the time it never rained, that are considered, you know, as some of his best work, well, the best work. His comment about that was that he said, I'm always with those, he said, they never sold as well as the, quote, we'll say powder burners. His were powder burners with a difference. But he said they never sold as well. And he said, and I think that was the reason was that I was preaching to the choir. He said, I was writing about a specific time, a specific place. And, uh, and, and I was, the people who read mostly it, that had to do with the they lived in that place too. They knew that life too. Um, Judy, take over. I, I can think of some more, but I'm going to get off of those first novels. Okay. Well, the the preaching to the choir line may explain why he was never a bestseller in New York. Um, but I think back. I think his first genre novel was Hot Iron in the mid '50s. And you look at that, and then you read The Time It Never Rained, and you can see how very much he grew as a writer. Western Writers of America has named him, the, am I right, Steve, the number one Western author? Yes. Yes, they did. Yes. So within the field, he's as good as you can get. The Time It Never Rained was really my first introduction to working with him. And I remember that I wrote some jacket copy that he didn't like because it is a character study, yeah. much more than a Western. It's a character study of a rancher who dared to be independent of government help during the bad years and who really never did win. Uh, in the very end, he, he goes from raising cattle to sheep to goats, which for a rancher is a gradual demotion. and. In the end, well, I don't want to give it away, but the land and the weather beat him. And I said something about, well, it, it's really a defeat. And Elmer said, life doesn't wrap up in ha happy packages. I wanted to show that. And in most of his really strong novels, and I used to be able to name all of them, that's true. He doesn't wrap it up in neat packages. Now, let me ask uh, all, all three of you, and then we'll end this segment. Um, is there any uh, writer, Western or non-Western, that uh, Kelton uh, either was directly influenced by, say, someone like a Max Brand, or maybe Steve might know, did your father uh, read uh, Isaac Asimov's sci-fi books, you know, in his spare time? Was that his, uh, you know, guilty pleasure or something? 
Steve, I don't know. Uh, I would say that Dad, Dad read all of the Western, the early Western novelists, uh, and to some degree was influenced by those. Largely, his influence was the cowboys that he knew. And that's why, in one for one reason, that his uh, his books were a little different even from the beginning because they were they were set and dealt with situations that he knew to be true uh, that he had actually lived through and, and whatnot. Uh, as far as someone out uh, else, Dad read voraciously, and he would. I don't know specifically that whether he read Asimov, but uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Judy, you want to comment? Um, I don't think you can leave out his high school teacher as an influence. Is it Paul Patterson? Absolutely. Um, and strangely enough, Elmer started out drawing rather than writing. But Patterson encouraged him to write until, I can't remember which one of them died first, but all their lives they were very loyal to each other. And there is a contemporary author Patrick Duran, who's doing pretty well, who gives Elmer credit for everything he's done. And Patrick's second credit goes to Paul Patterson. So the, and also Elmer tells that, he, first of all, he had weak eyes. Second of all, he wasn't a very good cowboy. And so he read a lot when he was a child. And there was one year that he was ill and had to miss school and stay home. And he really, learn to exercise his creativity during that year. So it was a lifelong process for him. Uh, Joyce, do you have any comment? Well, yes. Uh, I agree with, I'm, I'm interested in rehearing the things that Judy and Steve have told, told about their, uh, about Elmer. Uh, I think one thing that no reader has ever understood clearly unless you live there, been through it. And that's what a harsh, harsh place West Texas is. It's one of those places that when times are good, you don't want to leave it. But when times are bad, which was very often, you can't. And I think he clearly illustrates that in the time it never rained. Uh, he illustrates it in other, other uh, books as well. Even in Sand Hill Boys, he talks about the land. And he said it was a place that no one but a mother, uh, like an ugly child, that no one but a mother could really love. Colors are brown, not green, uh, about the only abundance there is, of, and that is space. And I still think truly that no one who has not lived there and through the times that Elmer went through there really understands the place he's writing about because it's too harsh and, and there's no way that film our uh, art uh, can really truly depict what an inhospitable land it is. And Elmer captured that, but we weren't interested in hearing about the land and how harsh it was. We were, interesting. we were interested in the characters he put on that land and how they survived or didn't. As Judy said, it's not always a happy kind of uh, uh, place. It's not the endings are not always happy or always pleasant. Uh, in fact, they're somewhat a surprise because you keep waiting for a happy ending and it's not always there. But uh, and especially in the time it never rained. Uh, I have other favorite books, but we can talk about that later. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add one thing. Yeah, go ahead. When, when you talk about him knowing the country and the land, TCU Press put together a collection of his non-fiction columns from Ron Stark Weekly. And that really shows where he got his material and how well he knew the people in the, in the land. It's called Elmer Kelton Country. It's one of the few, not only, but few non-fiction books, I think. All right, uh, yeah, we had a little, uh, I had a little bit of whistling there. Let me just ask one final question. Uh, Judy, you had helped uh, edit a book called Elmer Kelton Essays and Memories. Uh, is that is was that uh, drawn by Elmer himself a self port self portrait? No, that was done by Barbara Whitehead from a photograph. Okay. Barbara Whitehead is the designer who did almost all of our Elmer Kelton books. Okay. The Buffalo Soldier was the only exception 
because I knew an artist in Fort Worth who was specializing in Buffalo Soldiers. Okay, well, let's end this segment, and when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about some of uh, Elmer Kelton's uh, uh, most well-known books, including The Time It Never Rained. And I'm back with my guests, Steve Kelton, Judy Alter, and Joyce Roach, talking about uh, the writings of Elmer Kelton. So um, let me uh, start uh, with Judy, I guess. Um, what would you consider, other than The Time It Never Rained, his maybe top three or four other novels that, let's say, would establish his place in the canon? And let's just talk a little bit about that so that people who've never heard of Elmer Kelton, if they wanted to go read his top four or five books, you know, what would you suggest? The Good Old Boys, uh, The Day the Cowboys Quit, The Buffalo Soldier. And I want to say something about Buffalo Soldier because it illustrated something that he always said to us, listen to your characters and they will tell you what's going to happen. He started out to write a book about a Buffalo soldier, um, a freed slave who joined the army and was really, his life was on the rise. But there was a Comanche chief whose life was declining because the Comanches were losing their way of life. And Elmer said no matter how he tried to focus, on the Buffalo Soldier, the Comanche chief kept taking over. So in the end, it's a book about the rise of the Buffalo Soldier and the decline of the Comanche. And it parallels both perfectly and and it, um, I forgot where I was going with that, but it illustrates that the other one was the good old boys, I believe, that he sat at his father's bedside and wrote, and he said, the characters cook up, took over now, uh, uh, Steve, you'll have to help me, like a cold jawed horse, <laughs> that they yes. kept telling these stories, and he, it was almost like he was transcribing, because his characters told him what was going to happen, and mostly from stories that his dad told on, at his bedside, and stories that he'd heard all his life. Yeah, uh, Dad said that, and it was a problem for some people, he never had a synopsis ahead of time in a book. He never had it outlined. He said uh, he tried that a few times, but the characters always took it someplace he didn't intend for it to go. So there was no point in having that. Yeah, I know uh, as a writer myself, this is one of the things I tell to younger writers, that they say they get too welded on what their initial idea is, and I, I always tell them you have to you have to let it go where it goes. If you if, you know if you want to write a, a a poem or a story about a poodle and it turns out to be the Battle of the Bulge, go with the Battle of the Bulge, and you can always go back and write the poodle story again. Uh, so that that's that's uh, that's something I always tell young people. Uh, we ahead. talk about the difference between pantsers and plotters, <laughs> and Elmer was definitely a pantser. He wrote by the seat of his pants without a plot in mind. Yeah. He probably had a starting point, a story he wanted to tell, but it evolved as he worked on it. Yeah. How about you, Joyce? Uh, what, what, what are your opinions on uh, Kelton's sort of canon? Well, uh, it'll be a little bit different, perhaps, than, than the other two. I said I was not a scholar. I'm not a scholar in that I've not devoted my, my uh, writing or my life to uh, the things that a scholar does, but I did, I was a uh, adjunct professor at TCU, and I taught exclusively, uh, after a while, the Western novel and uh, literature of the Southwest. And, of course, in Western novel, uh, I chose to teach The Wolf and the Buffalo because I thought it, uh, it, was, it was a composite of, of different people and different issues. And the fact that he, as Judy has said, and Elmer too, um, excuse me, Steve, Steve, looking at you is a lot like looking at your dad. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, know, but I, I look older than he did. <laughs> oh, no. But uh, the wolf and the buffalo, it wasn't the buffalo soldier, Judy, it was the wolf and the buffalo was the title of that one. Uh, and uh, you had a, for one thing, it was one of the first times, a rare times, that Kelton would take a character 
and sit him down in a different world, he or she, in a different world, and let you see what happened to them. Uh, he did that in honor at daybreak, but in The Wolf and the Buffalo, he, he uh, took someone who knew absolutely nothing about the Western culture, who'd been a slave all his life, Gideon, uh, and his sort of uh, sidekick, as it turned out, Jimbo, who knew everything about horses, but not much else. And he takes those two characters as they become soldiers after the Civil War, and he sits them down in this, they come from this, this uh, tree forested place in the South and that sort of thing, takes them out and dumps them in many ways, uh, at least for the reader, dumps them in the middle of, of uh, around Fort Concho and, and San Angelo and those rough and wild and rugged places and lets you see what happens to them. So it's, uh, it's a double kind of thing as, as Gideon realizes, uh, or at, as Judy said, that his career or his life is on its way up. It's been at the very bottom. And he's about to find out who he really is uh, when he's dumped in that location. And uh, instead of being completely overwhelmed by it, he becomes, he becomes uh, himself. He realizes the strengths he has, the power he has, because of that landscape. Uh, and uh, then you have Grey Horse Running, who is, the, who is the Comanche. And as Judy said, his life is on the way down. His culture's life is on the way down. It's interesting that, that these two characters actually never meet. Uh, Gideon sees Grey Horse running through the grass one day and scares him to death, you know, because he knows there there are Indians there. That, uh, uh, but he and, but he doesn't know. He actually they never meet. And then the other part of that that is an interesting intermingling, and that is the life of the cavalry itself. That I don't know that that uh, uh, Elmer had ever written about exclusively. But to me, that's one of the most interesting uh, books. And as far as I'm concerned, my opinion, it is the best book. It certainly was the best book to teach because it had uh, college students were terribly taken with that particular book in that they'd never met that combination ever before in literature. And, of course, it was Western novel, and so I, I certainly stuck with that. But I think teaching Elmer's works was one of the things uh, and I did teach some others, but I think that Elmer's works were a revelation to a college class of students who'd never come across Western literature. After all, their lives had been busy reading what they're supposed to read, and it certainly didn't include Western literature, uh, either in high school or any other time. And that, to me, was one of the great pleasures of teaching Elmer Kelton in, in whatever I taught. But yeah. The Wolf and the Buffalo, I think, was the very best, for me, anyway. Well, let me ask you, Joyce, since you said that you taught Elmer Kelton, um, you know, in, in modern uh, uh, MFA writing classes, they always, uh, the, the emphasis is always on the self and what one is feeling at any given time. Uh, and in having read just the, the time it never rained, I get the sense that Elmer Kelton was someone who is a keen observer of life and is able to get inside other people, which is sort of antithetical to the way uh, writing classes teach nowadays, especially like the stuff that gets published in, in New York. And I'm wondering, did uh, any uh, of the students that you taught, uh, and I don't know if you taught uh, writing, uh, any, any writing classes as well, but uh, did you find that people were more interested in the way Kelton approached writing versus the way writing is now taught nowadays? No, I didn't notice that because they were so... This was their first introduction to Western literature of any kind. They always had to write a paper for me, you know, as part of it. But it was, um, it was not, you didn't, it was not a writing. I did not compare writing or what they were to look for, except for theme and characters, the kinds of things they would have be, they'd need to look for in any sort of literature that they were studying on the college level. Um, it, but they were so struck by the stories. Uh, they were so struck by uh, simply the plot, the, the characterization. They were certainly struck by that. And But as far as the, the way writing classes are taught and that sort of thing, no. Uh, I didn't teach it, you know, from that point of view. As I said, they had to write. 
and they didn't have any trouble writing. They just wrote, 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 which was delightful to, in a, a college class. It was not a, a course that had writing emphasis, but it was not a writing course per se, and it was not taught the way uh, a good many Leo literature courses are, are taught, except for the obvious, as I said, plot, theme, characterization, and uh, that sort of thing. I don't know whether I answered your question or not. No, you did. Uh, Judy, uh, how about you? Did you did you also teach Elma Kelton in class? No, I didn't do much teaching. I, I, I have done some, but not. But I wanted to pick up on what Joyce said about the wolf and the buffalo. One of the things Elmer always said was that he liked to take a character and put him in a time of change and see how he reacted. And one that we haven't mentioned yet, the man who wrote Midnight does that because it takes an older cowboy whose day has passed, but whose glory rests on the one time he was the only person that rode this outlaw horse. And he sees the world around him changing, and they're going to develop and put in an amusement park or something near where he lives. And he sent his grandson or nephew or something, a city kid, is sent to spend the summer with him. And it's a time of change for both of them and how they react to it. And I think that was an important theme in a lot of Elmer's work. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let me uh, focus on uh, the novel that I read, The Time It Never Rained. And uh, as most of you have said, most, most critics probably say that it's his best work. Um, I know uh, Joyce says she disagree disagrees, but um, it's the book that I read. And I had read uh, in... Uh, in the uh, memoir and essay book uh, that you uh, had uh, edited, Judy, I had read a little bit about it, and I read the book itself. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, uh, it was more Stein, more Steinbeck-like than than uh, I thought it was going to be. Because what always seemed to be the focus when people talk about the book was that the the character Charlie Flagg uh, is conservative or, or whatnot. But I think a lot of the critics have confused the character with the point of view of the novel. Because when I read the novel, it seems very clear to me that Charlie Flagg, uh, as one of you, I think uh, Judy had mentioned, all of his problems basically stem from his own stubbornness, whether it's based on his politics or whatnot. I mean, his, his son, uh, some of the other locals, after he shoots his mouth off to a local reporter uh, and the government withdraws his funds, it's, it's, it's like Charlie's living 20 or 30 years in the past, and he hasn't caught up with the then modern times of the 1950s, and his refusal to change is what begins his, his gradual descent. And it, it seemed to me that a lot of people were confusing Charlie Flagg with the, the point of view of the novel or with uh, Elmer Kelton, Kelton himself. Do you, do you agree with that or, or not? No, I don't think I do. I think Charlie Flagg was, as you say, conservative and, and behind the times, but he had his pride, and he wouldn't take government help with the strings that came attached to it. And compared to him is the character whose name I can't remember, who eventually, who has taken all this government dole and eventually commits suicide. Mm, yeah, the, the big rancher. I forget his name. About that. Yes. Um, Charlie remains true to Charlie and to what he believes is right. Uh, he does adapt, as I said, by going from cattle to sheep to goats. He realizes the change that's coming with the Mexican-American community and the family that he has long supported, but eventually can no longer keep on his ranch. So, yeah, he changes, but as I say, he remains true to himself. And that, that uh, particular... Uh, book two was written at a very real time, the drought of the 50s, when uh, the government was doing some dreadful things that we know now. For instance, having ranchers uh, kill their cattle uh, so that, you know, when it could have, uh, as Paul Patterson has been very clear about that, of course, Paul is, is gone now, but in talking about those times that Elmer knew as well, where the government, you know, instead of feeding, maybe taking it, the cattle and slaughtering them to feed the poor, instead they did, they uh, slaughtered cattle, made ranchers slaughter cattle and just bury them in a pit. Yeah. And that, that hurts 
people of that generation, myself included, to this very day, uh, that the government didn't perhaps behave as it should, but also that was another reason you'd have to know that in order to understand Charlie Flagg's stubbornness. Uh, and you, you, another thing I talked about, the kind of place it is. The place was a stubborn place. The land, they say, is unforgiving, you know, and certainly it was. But neither, the people reflected that stubbornness. Uh, they just did. I don't think I knew of anybody that was not a stubborn rancher, <laughs> or maybe farmer too, but certainly stubborn ranchers. Uh, it's a characteristic that hurts them to this day. But I think that uh, Charlie represents those that were stubborn to a fault. And yet, in a way, as Judy said, it was always Elmer places his characters at a time of change. And you get to see how they either do or don't adapt to it. And I don't think anybody in his novels ever adapted much to change. Some did. But in a, in a sense, of course, Charlie did adapt. And he did have to give in to uh, sheep and goats. And my word, what a come down that was. And yet at the end of things, uh, his stubbornness somehow has brought him through. You know, there's hope at the end of of that novel. He's not lost his land. Uh, he's not uh, given in to moving away. He has endured it. And in a sense, it's a very hopeful end. Charlie is going to make it, even if that's the best. life reunited. I mean, they grew closer, which was a, a part of the whole theme of the novel. Right. Well, uh, let me ask, uh, there's a, a few interesting passages about Charlie and his wife where he's describing her, and I found that it's a very realistic kind of uh, portrayal of marriage. It's not, the, it's not the sort of sappy Hollywood kind of portrayal of marriage, and uh, uh, are there a lot of, in, in Kelton's other works, uh, are there other portrayals of, of human interactions that are as interesting, and for Steve specifically, you could start off, Steve, was uh, the relationship of Kelton... Uh, uh, of rather uh, Charlie Flagg to his wife, similar to that between your mother and, and Elmer? I would say in some respects. Uh, Dad would probably tell you he wasn't quite as stubborn as Charlie, but I think he was wrong. Uh, he came from stubborn stock on both sides, and, and then Mom didn't help anything either. Her, her family in Austria, the, that, that village actually had a a term uh, that, that applied specifically to her family, and it was uh, Leapshale. And the family name was Leap, L-I-P-P, -P, and the shale evidently were, uh, was the German for a hard head. And in that village, the, the whole family was known that way. So uh, his stubbornness and her stubbornness and um, they got along just great. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let, let me just, uh, let's end this segment here. Uh, we're having a little audio difficulty, and uh, when we get back, we'll talk a bit more about uh, uh, the time it never rained. All right, uh, back with uh, Steve Kelton, Judy Alter, and Joyce Roach talking about Elmer Kelton. And uh, Steve, you wanted to make a comment, a final comment about uh, the time it never rained uh, in response to Joyce's comment about the book's ending. So, Steve? Right. Uh, Joyce had, had said that uh, she saw a, a hopeful ending in it, despite uh, the bitterness of, of how it came about. And uh, I agree with that because... Uh, what the way it ended? Uh, Charlie hold on, hold, hold, on, hold on, Steve. Hold on, Steve. We lost you in there. Oh, okay. Oh, there no, oh, there, there she's back. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Charlie basically said he was just going to start over. Yeah. Uh, with what he had, and he said a man can always start over because a man has to, and now you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's a it's a tough situation. You don't know, but Charlie never gave up. Yeah, you, the, to the, me the, that's that's a hopeful thing about human nature, and particularly a stubborn person. Yeah, the, that that's I think one of the things that makes Charlie Flagg an interesting protagonist is that uh, 
no matter how many times life takes a dump on him, he just keeps on going, even if he's just limping along. The, one of my favorite scenes is the scene where he's out, I think, in a rainstorm, and he twists his ankle or breaks his ankle, and uh, uh, some young uh, Mexican uh, greaseback, as they or grease greaseback or greaseball, as they call wetback, is, is what they, he calls him in the novel, the old derogatory term. Uh, some young kid uh, basically comes and, and saves his life, otherwise he would have frozen. And uh, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, Joyce, uh, you had wanted to talk a, a little bit about uh, uh, Elmer Kelton and his writing of women in his work. So if you want to expound, go ahead. Well, um, of course, uh, what made me think of that, and that was the uh, Charlie Flagg's wife. And as we said, she was a uh, a helpmate. But she was good more than just a helpmate in that she participated fully in that life. Uh, and I think it caused me to think about women in general. Uh, as far as women in general, it's been even mentioned to Elmer uh, by others that his uh, women characters were not modern women in the sense that uh, they took the bit in their teeth, as the saying goes. But his women were not uh, ever particularly the big protagonists. They were women who were helpful and that sort of thing, even though they had different forms of being helpful, uh, different ways of being helpful. But I think about the, uh, the woman in, uh, the, excuse me, the good old boys, uh, Spring, uh, which is an interesting character in that she was not the kind of woman that she she loved. Uh, I've forgotten the hero's name in that one. For you know, she loved <laughs> Huey the, Calloway. Pardon me. Huey Calloway. Yeah, you know, Huey Calloway. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, she loved Huey Calloway, but she wasn't. Of course, Huey wasn't willing to marry her, and she wasn't willing to give in to to uh, that. You know, she was a school teacher. Uh, Elmer said that a little of his mother. Uh, was in that character, but uh, she was a little different in that she held out and, you know, she wasn't willing to marry him if he wasn't willing, quote, to settle down, and, and Huey was not willing to settle down. So there's uh, another uh, kind of woman. Then uh, Huey's brother's wife was yet a different kind of woman. She had settled into, you know, to a home life and didn't understand making a, a, a homemaker and a wife and a mother. And uh, she fussed at Huey because he wasn't willing to do that. And Spring wasn't willing to do it Huey, Huey's, uh, Huey's way. Another female character, of course, that I think is interesting, uh, and that is in The Wolf and the Buffalo. You've got more than one woman, uh, kind of woman. You have the cavalry wife who was faithful, used to being alone, accepted it, used to having to take care of herself while husband was gone, and you have that view of women, which is a little different than, than the general one you hear about. You had uh, Gray Horse Running, uh, his wife, I think maybe Willow was her name, who was a typical Plains woman, uh, devoted in, in the way that a, that a Native American or Indian woman, Comanche woman was. Uh, she's yet a little different story than that. Uh, you have... Uh, even uh, Gideon uh, was a, another type of, of woman, uh, a black woman, who was really sort of a uh, prostitute put out by, by her uh, mother, or grandmother, I think it was. So there's a different portrayal of women uh, that, that we don't usually see. But Elmer is called a code of the West kind of man, where women... Uh, you know, where men were men and women stayed home uh, was an explanation of that. So I think his, his handling of women is interesting. And, and Elmer and, uh, excuse me, Steve and Judy may have something else to say about that. Well, let me ask, did, uh, were there no female lead characters in any of his books? They were all male then? All male. Okay. I don't, I don't recall any of them. Okay. Uh, and I know the, the one character that stands out to me in... Uh, uh, the time it never rained is the daughter-in-law. She's sort of the coming of the 1960s, more modern woman. She's always pushing the, almost bullying uh, uh, Charlie's son into doing this and that to become a rodeo star. Um, but uh, Judy, go ahead. Uh, it looked like you wanted to say something. Uh, 
Well, Elmer actually caught a little criticism for his handling of women. It was often said that he didn't seem to understand them as well as he did his male characters. And what Joyce says about the Code of the West is right. In person, Elmer was always the perfect gentleman to women. He was courteous and courtly and just really admirable. But in some of the minor characters, like the wife, the young wife in The Time It Never Rained, he did not develop them as thoroughly as he did some of his others. I can't remember specifically, but Joyce, didn't you do an essay on women in Kelton? No, no, I didn't. Not that I, not that I remember Judy doing that. I wrote, you know, other things, but I don't think I wrote about the women unless I was just talking about a particular character. And I did write about uh, in the afterward that I wrote for Honor at Daybreak. I did talk about this being a different kind of woman than than Elmer had ever dealt with uh, before, but. That was that's all. No, I've not written about you know just. Well, I think there's an essay in that book, memoirs and essays, memories and essays on on Kelton's use of women. There is. You're right, but I can't remember who it was. Let me take a yeah, look. Here. And it was quite critical. In fact, I wanted to leave it under the book. <laughs> Let's see here. Hang on. Uh, Converter got race, race and ethnicity. The Huey Calloway trilogy. Reading and roping. Uh, humor in Kelton, Elmer Kelton speaks out, the Westerner. Uh, I don't see one on women. Let's see. Race and ethnicity, Elmer Kelton. Uh, Joyce Roach, Huey mm -hmm. Kelton, reading. But there's nothing about women in there. No, there, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't recall it. I don't see it in the... Well, then I don't know where I saw it. But. Uh, Judy, I think uh, perhaps it... I was at... A conference uh, TCU sponsored many years ago there at Fort Worth, and uh, and I think that was one of the, the one of the I don't remember it from that, though I can't remember too much in the way of detail. Was that the time that he um, politely tangled with Patricia Nelson Limerick? It could be. Was a new historian, and she really resented that the history of the West was the history of the conquest by Anglo males, and she lit into your dad, but he hung his own. I remember that. And um, they parted friends, and he sent her away with an autographed copy of, I believe, The Time It Was Never Rained. I mean, The Time It Never Rained. Yeah, that, that may be what I'm remembering. Uh, it, it's been so long, that I just, uh, the details I couldn't remember. That Code of the West came out, because he was very polite and restrained. More so than she. Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about the first book of Alma Kelton's that I read a few years back, which was his memoir *Sand Hills Boy*, and uh, we'll bring this uh, sort of full circle uh, uh, to back to how I opened the interview with Steve. Um, you know, uh, in, in reading through it, uh, it's very interesting uh, descriptions of the land, descriptions of uh, the way people interact. Uh, uh, the the droughts that were gone through. Um, now I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit more in depth about your father's World War II role. Um, uh, he w was he on the front lines, or was he a medic, or what? What exactly did your father do, Steve, during World War II? He was a rocket man. Uh, he had been trained originally in the artillery for any aircraft, uh -huh. and just before they were going to ship out. Uh, the War Department decided they didn't need any more anti-aircraft people because there wasn't any any aircraft left to shoot at. Luftwaffe was pretty much gone. So they decided that, that they really did need combat riflemen. And Dad had gone into the artillery. They placed him there because he had flat feet. And so uh, then they decided he ought to be an artillery, uh, an, an infantry soldier, flat feet and all, and he sort of lost his faith in the military judgment at that point. But uh, I think it took another six weeks or more, or two months, whatever it was, to retrain these artillerymen in the small squad tactics where they could actually survive as uh, riflemen. And uh, Dad's job was to carry the uh, mortar rounds or the, the rounds for the uh, uh, bazooka. Now, consequently, he was the rocket man. 
and you had the guy who carried the tube and you got the guy who carried the, the rockets. And Dad was uh, probably the smallest man in his squad, and he got the load of rockets. But at least they were kind enough to give him a small carbine instead of the heavy battle rifle. Now, how did how did your father actually meet your mother? Uh, she was in Austria, wasn't he? Right. This was during the occupation post-war, uh, immediately post-war. Uh-huh. Dad uh, was in the uh, displaced persons area. And um, at one point, he was stationed in mom's hometown of Ebensee, Austria. And they met uh, down by the, the lakeside. There was a big lake there, Glacier Lake. And uh, they met down by the lakeside. She came down to check a train schedule or a schedule for the boat going across the lake. And they struck up a conversation, uh, neither one of them speaking the other's language. But uh, dad did better with German than mom did with English at first. But that's how they met. And uh, he asked her if he could walk her home. And she wasn't too sure about that, but okay. And then one thing led to another. She made, she baked him an apple strudel, and that was the that was the beginning of the end of that deal because he, he just couldn't get away from that apple strudel. Now, now your mother already had a child. Was she like a war widow? Yes, yes, and uh, essentially. And uh, my brother was six years old when they came over here in 1947. Is he still alive then? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so. Uh, didn't, now, I, I believe in the memoir, your father had been shipped back to the U.S. and he came back for your mother and your brother a year later, right? Well, he sent for them. Yeah, uh, okay. If he had the choice, he could uh, he could have married her then and before he mustered out, any, but he would have had to have mustered out in Europe and paid for both of them, you know, all of them to come over. Or he could come back to this country and muster out on Uncle Sam's nickel, and then sent for my mother and brother. And that's the way he chose to do it. And he paid for their passage. And uh, my grandfather over there, is when Dad left, it, it was common knowledge. I mean, almost none of the GIs who promised to bring their girlfriends over ever did. Huh. And uh, he said, well, that's the last you'll see of him. And sure enough, about a year or so later, uh, they were able to, to make the transition to come over. And my dad and my grandmother and a great aunt met them in New York and drove them all the way back out to West Texas. I like to imagine that scene uh, some of those, that meeting of mother and grandmother and uh, <laughs> and Anne and, and uh, I've forgotten, I've forgotten your brother's name. Again, uh, I would certainly, certainly enjoy trying to, to think of that and what a, what a shock on both sides, you know. Yes. No absolutely. English and no German and all that went on. That's one of my favorite stories about. It seems you know, to me I heard a story about your mom's first reaction to West Texas and the landscape. Uh-huh. Go ahead with that one. I don't remember it. You tell me. Oh. Well, it was uh, right about the 4th of July. And the 4th of July in West Texas, uh, anyone who's been here around the 4th of July realized how brutal it is. Uh, she had a little chance of transition in that long drive from New York. But uh, let's see, she talked about coming in on the ranch, on one of the roads there, and it was late at night and all she could see in the headlights were jackrabbits running back and forth across the road. Every once in a while, they'd hit one. And it just, you know, she was used to rabbits at home that were fat, and, and they, they raised them and ate them. But she wasn't used to people running over them. <laughs> so it disturbed her quite a bit. But uh, I, I remember those scenes myself, you know, from other years. But when the jackrabbits were thick, they were really thick. And they'd run back and forth across the road, and there wasn't any way on earth to miss them. Yeah. I remember one time my wife and I were in Big Bend, and we were driving down a road, and there was this blown jackrabbit that came out of nowhere and seemed to have a death wish. He ran straight for the tire. He was behind us, and he outran us and went straight for the tire. And I hit him, and I'm like, I'm like oh, my God. And, and, and I'm like, he, it was a suicidal hare. I mean, it was, it was just crazy. 
I've had deer do that, and uh, they did as much damage to my vehicle as I did to them. <laughs> um, well, let me uh, let me ask uh, both uh, Judy and uh, Joyce. Then uh, uh, we're sitting in the year 2015, and uh, we've mentioned that uh, Elma Kelton uh, is acknowledged or voted. I guess I don't know if it's voted or how he, but he's acknowledged as uh, the the top Western writer by the Western Writers of America. Where do you think uh, uh, in the coming, say, the rest of this century, uh, where do you think Western writing, writing will go? Where will Kelton's place in Western writing be? And what do you think his continuing legacy will be, uh, either Joyce or Judy? I think um, Jim Lee used to talk about writers who will be still 100 years from now. I think Elmer is one of those. I, I think his work will last. Um, I, I'm not really up on what's happening in the Western today. But I, was I think Elmer's legacy is one of transforming the genre so that we got some better literature out of it. Yeah. Um, and, and as I say, I think his reputation will live on. How about Joyce? you, Joyce? I, I certainly agree with that. I had occasion to uh, go into Western Writers of America uh, website looking at uh, the meeting that's coming up in June. And I was surprised not to see Elmer's name uh, anymore there. It doesn't have anything to do with his place, you know, historically. But there were other names, particularly Carmack McCarthy, uh, I'm trying to think who else was up there that I recognized, but certainly who write a different kind of Western. And in fact, Western Writers of America uh, had to make a big change itself, and that they were, for a while, not willing, especially I can remember in the short story and even in the novel, well, that's not Western literature, they said. Uh, and, of course, that was a time when they were beginning to realize that they had to include more than just the traditional Western or the traditional Western short story or traditional anything, um, and recognize that things were, you know, going in another way. So that that tells me, okay, Larry McMurtry was the other one. Larry McMurtry and uh, uh, Cormac McCarthy, and there were some other names that, frankly, I didn't didn't even recognize those two. I did, but. So uh, Western writing itself is changing dramatically, uh, and there, the things that are called Westerns would be not recognized as Westerns in the past when, when Elmer was at the height of his writing. Um, certainly, Elmer found out even in his lifetime that the publishers, great publishers of Westerns, a uh, whole you know, section that they had, and that was Doubleday, and then Doubleday stopped uh, and, and Elmer went had to go to another publisher because they weren't interested in any of, quote, the old style writing. But I, was, I agree with you, the Elmer's place is secure for all time. And, well, but it's not, as I said, it's not particularly recognized today. Well, let me ask, uh, though, uh, that might be a good thing overall because, uh, you know, Genres can often be ghettos, and uh, it sometimes takes a couple of generations to get writers or any artist out of a particular ghetto. Because uh, Kelton, uh, at least uh, in uh, the time it never rained, I think as a book, aside from the fact that it's set in Texas, I mean, I think that's a, as good a book uh, written in the the second half of the twentieth century. You know, and you can compare him to people like a Kurt Vonnegut or a John Updike or other people of that ilk. Uh, or Norman Mailer or whatnot. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, do you? No, I don't. No, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, as I said, his place is secure, mm -hmm. uh, the way I look at it. And it, it, you know, nothing, nothing will change that. Judy, do, do you agree? Yes, but I was thinking, as Joyce talked about the changing of the Western, about the time a woman's novel won the Spur Award for the best novel, and one of the male members of the organization was absolutely indignant because that category was for the men's action novel. And right, and it's you who won that. Elmer, pardon? It was you who won that. Yeah, it was. Woman. That's what Elmer 
moved beyond. I mean, you know, he he was way ahead of his time getting the genre out of, or getting Western literature out of the men's action category. Well, let's uh, end this segment, and when we get back, we'll uh, end the interview and give you each a, a final uh, say on Al McKelvin. So we'll do that in just a moment. Well, let's uh, end this uh, interview about uh, Elmer Kelton, uh, and I want to give each of my three guests a, a final say-so on uh, anything related to Elmer Kelton or the Western novel. So let's uh, start with Joyce. Uh, uh, any final uh, opinions about uh, uh, the Western or Elmer Kelton, Judy, uh, Joyce? Well, I think I probably said most of it in my last comments about Elmer's place in literature, but I think one of the things that has been the most pleasant in thinking about Elmer is that I have been able to write about him, uh, write about his work, not necessarily about him, but I've been able to write about his work, uh, and I think maybe that places me in a, in a pretty good position as far as, as being able to assess his work and when someone asks you to write about him. Um, maybe it is because he belongs to me, he belongs to us, he belongs to Texas, uh, but I don't think that ever stopped him from uh, jumping borders always with his writing, and that is important. He was a good friend, and uh, that meant a whole lot to me, and I'm sure it did to Judy as well, and I think we felt that we knew him personally. We knew all about him uh, as much as we needed to know, but we were also privileged to, to be able to write about him. And uh, in my case, it was a privilege for to have him write about me. And that is the last thing I can say about Elmer, that I can't say it any better or any, add any more to it, but he's very, very special to me personally, uh, as well as uh, being able to, to write about him. Okay. Uh, Judy, any final comments from you? Well, he's very was very important to me personally too, and I felt it was one of the big privileges of my career to get to work with him and to get to know him. As far as his reputation living on, I think we should mention that a critic whose name oh John Tuska once said that *The Time It Never Rained* was one of the dozen or so best American novels written in the 20th century. And he didn't say best Western novels. He said best novels. And I think that kind of puts Elmer's career in perspective. And I, he was very important to TCU Press and very important to Joyce and me. Okay. So, uh, and I'm glad to get to know Steve and Ann through that connection. Steve, if you want to have a final say. Well, uh, I'd have to say he was pretty important to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But, I find it odd in a way uh, to talk about that in the past tense because for me, he's still here. Uh, he'll always be here. And part of that is that the books are there. But uh, sometimes I just kind of hear him talking to me in a certain way. Just as he talked about his characters driving the story, uh, narrating to uh, Dad's still here. He'll never be gone. He died in what, 09? 09. Yeah, so did my mother. Yeah. Uh, one final question for you, Steve. Um, have, has there ever been any film uh, adaptations or uh, TV adaptations of Elmer's work? And if, so, if not, or anything, now I guess you and the family control his estate, are you negotiating anything uh, in the possible future? Well, uh, the, the Turner Network and uh, Produced the Good Old Boys with Tommy Lee Jones. He was the uh, he was Huey Calloway. He also directed it and wrote the screenplay. Uh -huh. uh, Sissy Spacek was in that. Uh, gosh, uh, just a heck of a good cast, and they did a tremendously good job about it. And uh, Dad helped them with uh, describing the the home place as he knew it and, and all that sort of thing. It was a darn good production, and. It's a shame it was always a television novel, but it is available on DVDs. Uh, as to something else current, uh, The Day the Cowboys Quit is in pre-production, I think, basically, or whatever you'd call that, but 
um, uh, Robert, um, oh, good heavens. Robert Duvall? Hmm? Robert Duvall? Duvall, absolutely. He has that one optioned, and uh, and I think uh, AMC is going to do that. It'll be a two-night miniseries. Uh, the, the Time It Never Rained uh, has been in under option for a long time, and, and a woman who's just worked herself half to death trying to get that done. And, of course, you, you run into things. Everybody's gung-ho until it comes down to the money in Hollywood. And uh, so that's that's still hanging fire as far as I know. But uh, Robert Duvall is, is the current um, best chance. Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking Robert Duvall early in the interview that, that he'd be something attached to such a project. I was looking at some of the photos and, and that drawing uh, of Elmer Kelton on the Essays and uh, Memories book. Uh, I think uh, the actor Randy Quaid actually has some of the facial features. He could probably play a, a younger version of your father if they ever did uh, his life story. But uh, I want to thank uh, all three of you, Joyce, uh, Judy, and Steve, that were talking about Elmer Kelton. And uh, I think his uh, writing is worthwhile and should be read. And I know in the coming years I'll uh, uh, end up reading some more of his novels. And uh, I have three of his books that I would recommend reading. The first is the Elmer Kelton Essays and Memories, which was co-edited by Judy Alter. The second is uh, Sand Hill's Boys, The Winding Trail of a Texas Rider, which is uh, the memoir that Kelton himself wrote. And, uh, of course, uh, finally, The Time It Never Rained, which is uh, generally, uh, with uh, Joyce's noted exception, uh, by most people uh, uh, considered Kelton's best novel. So if you're interested in uh, good writing, whether it's Wesson or just good writing in general, I would uh, recommend young people... Uh, read Elmer Kelton or find him out, whether you're in Texas or whether you're in Montana or whether you're in Argentina. But uh, I, again, thanks to all three of you. And uh, next week I will be talking uh, a, a little bit more about uh, some other writing and uh, uh, in, in another show. So join me then. But again, thank you to Joyce, Judy, and Steve. And uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.